Welcome back to Out of Home Insider, the loudest voice in Out of Home. The guest spotlights are back. We're back with a guest spotlight today, Kevin Gephardt. He's not only a contributing columnist to Billboard Insider, but he is co-author of the new book, The Ultimate Out of Home Sales Guide. This is going to be a really tactical episode. If you are a local seller, if you're out there pulling doors every day, calling on small local businesses, trying to get your pitch in front of them, this is going to be an episode for you. Kevin shares a ton of really tactical things that you can do today, things that you could start to incorporate into your sales process, your own marketing process. Uh, Kevin shares a lot of insight in this episode. He gives a lot of stuff away too. So the show notes are going to be especially valuable on this one. Kevin gives us links to a few different downloadables. So without further ado, let's go. Welcome, everybody, to the Out of Home Insider Show, a podcast like no other, hosted by the one and only Tim Rowe. Get ready to have some knowledge dropped on you and to be entertained because nothing's more valuable than food for your brain. So sit back, relax, we're about to dive in as the best industry podcast is about to begin. Kevin, thanks so much for being here. Tim, I've been looking forward to this. You and I have been in so many discussions over the last six months about this. I'm glad we finally brought it together. Thank Absolutely. You. We're going to talk about a lot of things here. We're going to touch on, you've got a new book out. So really excited to talk about that. We're going to talk about some of the challenges of being in media sales and, and navigating uh, tricky economic uh, waters, something that that you're uh, well-versed at and a veteran of uh, throughout your career. You've seen a a few of these types of occasions. So we're going to get into some of that, but Kevin, really, I think maybe a, a great place to start is, is kind of the origin story with how did you get in and out of home? Started on the air as an air talent, then got into business uh, in the business side, got into sales at a radio station, decided that I liked the business side better, got into sales management, general management. And then later I decided I didn't like management. I really, what I liked, what turns me on is meeting with clients and doing programs and putting stuff together, creating on the street. So I went to Clear Channel Radio uh, as a senior account exec, was there for eight years, and then was really intrigued by the billboard business. A good friend of mine who I'd cross-sold a lot of programs with said, hey, why don't you come and talk to us? You, you'd be a great billboard seller. And I never thought of it. I came home and talked to my wife, Deb. I said, you know, this is really, the more I think about it, it's a really cool idea. So I uh, signed down at the Billboard Division 12 years ago and ended my active selling with Clear Channel at the end of 2020, so December of 2020. And then they did a really cool thing. They put me up on 64 digital billboards in Minneapolis and St. Paul, congratulating me on my retirement. How cool. Tim, I'm like, if I had maintained my status as an air talent, I would have never gotten that. <laughs> I left the company. Right. It was unbelievable. So anyway, caught Dave Westberg's eye at Billboard Insider. And he said, hey, you've sold radio, you sold billboards. Let's do a piece on what the difference of the selling is. And so we did. It led to several columns. Dave's always had a lot of uh, interest among his readers in terms of having more sales material. He said, I think there's a book here. Let's, let's do a book. So we wrote a book, uh, started about a year and a half ago put it all together. It just hit the street here about three weeks ago. It's called the ultimate out of home sales guide, a competitive advantage to selling out of home. And I guess the best way to sum it up, Tim, is so often when I see people in the business and I say, what do you know now that you wish you would have known then? Because I was taught that experience is a great teacher. It's just the tuition is so high. You don't want to do it. <laughs> Sure. So I put together in this book, 38 chapters of things I wish I would have known when I started selling. And I didn't realize, Tim, when I, when I quit actively selling, that I did have this enormous background of ideas and strategies that I use all the time that people that haven't been around that long don't have. Sure. I always believed that when you work for a company, you get two paychecks, you get your money, but you also get training and insights that are going to pay you dividends long past when the money's spent. And the, the ideas and things that I talk about in the book and that I talk about in other forms of communication about selling are things I've learned a long time ago from some really, really smart people. So I feel like I'm, I'm right now I'm cashing that second paycheck of um, experience, training, and insights. So it's been very fun. 
Well, congratulations. That is, uh, that's something that we're going to get into a little bit more of is what is the undertaking of taking two decades and, and, and consolidating it into 38 unique uh, strategies that, that you can practically apply. But was that always your mindset? Did you always think about work through that lens of, of delivering it to, of two paychecks? Or was that something that developed no, it, over it time occurred for to you? Me, it occurred to me uh, actually the last few years of my active selling career, because I, I started talking and the reason the, the branch I worked for, for Clear Channel Outdoor, we had a, a, a process whereby we would do presentations um, periodically. And so when it was my turn to do a presentation, I did a presentation on, I think it was always, it was uh, a process for creating ideas, which hmm. is a really cool teaching. If you ever want to jump on a podcast, we can talk about that. Sure. The, but I that, realized that creating the catalyst is one of the hardest things to do, the spark. Right. right. Somebody explained to me that we're not into selling billboards. We're into selling ideas. So then you need to have a specific process of where do ideas come from? And it is a very specific recipe. It's just like making cookies or anything else. It's a very specific, specific five-step process. So I realized when I did this presentation at the sales meeting, I thought, you know, um, I've been paid really well over the years because I've been paid with this knowledge and this insight along with my paycheck. So to answer your question, it's kind of a long answer to your question, but to answer your question, um, a couple of years before I quit actively selling, I realized I was getting these paychecks all along and hadn't cashed them. And now we're cashing them. So what are those, what is that framework for idea generation? Somebody maybe listen to this right now going, I'm absolutely stumped. I need to, I need to place to start. And Kevin just mentioned this five-step framework. How, how does that work? Well, first of all, if I can plug my website, it's Please. oohsalesfaster.com. And if you click on the tab that says best advice and you scroll down uh, a little bit, you'll find that I did an actual piece on this that has all the detail to what I'm going to about to tell you. But it's based on a 1932 book called A Technique for Producing Ideas. And it's it's founded in some very solid psychology, but it was used by one of the forerunners of DD. DDB, DD, uh, forget the name of it, DDB Needham okay. at age. Okay. It was one of their early founders. And he had figured this out. And through consulting, I say some psychologists about the whole mind process of this, he distilled it down to six steps. And there's more to it than this, but I'll just kind of tell you the steps are first of all, you gather the information. Then you throw it into this big computer processor that we have on the head of our shoulders, on the top of our shoulders, and you let it and trust the process is going to bring you ideas. And then you basically make lists and choices, which is a very psychologically uh, sound basis for determining which direction you want to go. And then it talks about how you troubleshoot those and then how you bring your, your new baby, your idea out into the light of day. And I'm abbreviating this really quickly for the for the time we have here, but you use it to generate ideas for somebody's creative, use it to generate ideas for pursuing a tough client, for succeeding during res recessionary times, whatever, whatever obstacle you have, the process works to create ideas. Love that and super practical. And even just as you were walking through it, and it was kind of visualizing it you can you can see that process i'm a i'm a very tactile type of person i've got notebooks everywhere and i'm always scribbling and lists of ideas are are, are certainly something that uh that, that i appreciate but that makes a lot of sense so it's, but then understanding that it is a framework and this is something that can create a predictable repeatable outcome which is idea generation i think that that obviously has lots of practicality in in, in a selling career for all the reasons that you just spoke to, how am I going to get in front of this prospect? How am I going to retain this account? How am I going to keep bringing them new creative campaign ideas? All of those and, things. And the book has been, has gone back into print up to a few years ago. It was back into print a technique for producing ideas by Del Webb young. And 
I, I'll just caution your readers that, you know, it was written in the late 20s, early 30s. OK, so it has a lot of sexist kind of references. You have to look past that because you have to get to the idea and the strategy that he identified, which is powerful. But you can find it online if you want the book or you can get it for free on my website. Awesome. Well, we definitely uh, will link to all of those great resources below. You touched on something that I think is becoming more relevant as as we as consumers feel uh, feel the burden of, of a shifting economy. But navigating recession, we saw 2008, 2009, obviously probably the most recent in in most of our memories, uh, you know, from from a larger scale. But then shutdowns in 2020 certainly disrupted things. As we start to kind of embrace that there's there's a different economy um, developing here as we close out the second half of the year, how do you advise other sellers? How did you navigate challenging times like that? Maybe we could get into some really tactical recession-proof stuff. I love what Sam Walton said back in the day. Everybody knows him as the founder of Walmart. And they said, Sam, what do you think of the recession? He goes, I thought about it. And I've decided not to participate. Mm, I love that. I love I, I love voluntary too. participation. I, I do too. The average recession only lasts 10 to 11 months. Most people are, when with salespeople and business owners, they cower at the word recession. And it's like kryptonite. What if your competitors were all put under a spell? And under that spell, they decided to quit prospecting, to quit pushing their customer's ambition level, and basically to quit trying. What kind of a competitive advantage would that give you as a sales rep? Enormous, right? Everybody's lulled to sleep. That's what the recession does to us. And it we're put under the spell by media that is constantly beating the drum of things not going well in the business community. I believe in the yin-yang theory. Your strength is your weakness. Your weakness is your strength. It, it sounds like it sounds like wordplay gobbledygook, but it's very powerful. Every for every business that's suffering during the recession, there is one that is thriving. It's just a fact of life. The news media has no incentive to provide you with who those people are. Coincidentally, I've compiled a list of like over forty-seven different local ad categories that wow. do well in a recession, and I will make that available to anybody listening, Tim. If they want to drop me a message at my website, OOHSalesFaster.com, and request the 46, 47 recession thriving categories, just reference it, and I'll send them the whole list. But these are local businesses that do well during a recession. So you have to look at it for what it is. And there's enormous opportunity in here with a lot of companies that we may or may not think of or know of. And I have a ton of information about companies that have pulled back their advertising during recessionary times, starting in back in the 20s up to and including the, you know, the, the last recession, 08, 09. It's, I have volumes of information about companies that have thrived during the recession and long after because they didn't pull in their horns. They actually went out while they're while their competitors, their advertising competitors were asleep and under the spell. And they grabbed market share that that their competitors never did get back. I want to talk about, for example, um, post cereals. And this might seem like ancient history to some, but post cereals back in the 20s pulled back on their advertising. They didn't feel they needed it. Most people don't know the post brand, but back in the 20s and 30s, it was the household cereal brand. Okay? So this is like Great Depression kind of right. induced. Exactly. We're just Late 20s, into the Great early Depression. 30s. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And all of a sudden in Michigan, Dr. Kellogg decided that he was going to take them on because they're they're falling under the recession spell. So he launched a little product called Rice Krispies. Mm. And he gained market share from Post that they have, to this date, 80 some years later, have not recovered from. Wow. It's, it's astounding. Coca Cola was a worldwide brand back in the late 50s. They had just come through World War II. They, they used World War II as a way to build their international distribution model. They said, we don't need to advertise that much. Everybody knows Coca Cola. Unbeknownst, 
to their competitor in upstate New York and purchased New York. There was a little company trying to make waves called Pepsi. And Pepsi didn't know that Coke was going to be cutting their ad spend, but they poured on the steam because they wanted to get noticed. And the combination of those two things allowed Pepsi to get a foothold as the number two cola brand. And Pepsi has gained market share on Coca-Cola that 80 some years later, they have not ever relinquished. I, I want to tell you one other story about recession. Sony, big international company, during the 08, 09 recession, it was hard on everybody. So they slashed expenses to keep their balance sheet, their profitability intact. And it worked. During 08, 09, 10, they were able to show profitability that their competitors weren't showing. What happened since 08, 09 is that they were used to 11% a year sales gains. After the 08, 09 recession, it dropped to 1% a year. And that's wow. when Samsung and all these other companies- LG, Vizio, LG, all those brands and, that emerged from and 08, I don't know, 09, yeah. I don't track the performance that closely, but I don't know that they're back to double digit growth or have been since 09. So these are things that you can use to enlighten your advertisers about the fact that this is not the time to be pulling back your horns. People might watch this. I My, my um, wheelhouse is local direct billboard sales. That's what I did for many years. And that's what I my training is aimed at. Some people might say, well, Kevin, these are great national, international stories, but how does that relate to my market? That was well, literally going to be my follow-up question. That's great. But what if I'm a local salesperson with the, a mom the, and pop business who's yeah, absolutely. just trying That's to make where we live. this week? That's where we live. I never sold one billboard to Sony or any of these other companies. I, I sell them locally. The challenge is that the data and the case studies for local advertisers is just not available. It's I've, if, if somebody has a source for it, I would love for them to email me, but it's just not available. So we have to take these these larger examples and know that there are lessons here for mm. local advertisers and, and apply them. The other thing I wanted to mention is during a recession and downturns, consumers tend to fall into four different categories. They, um, and I, I want to just refer to my notes here because I don't want to, I don't want to state those, but they fall into buying categories that are indicative of where they're at at the moment. They have the slam on the brakes category, mm -hmm. people that just are going to stop. The pain. Stop spending. Stop spending, stop buying. Got things. it. Then we have the pained but patient. Okay. And there are people that are annoyed with the gas prices and the rising interest rates, but they're going to be patient. We have the comfortably well off, which doesn't tend to be affected by any of it. And then we have the live for today group. Mm -hmm. Each one of those four groups has to be messaged to discreetly and distinctly. And if your listeners want to email me, I'll send you the four categories of messaging that you want to use for each one of the four consumer buying. Category. And what, what's your, what's your email in case they want to skip the step of going to the website? Sure. And well, they can, yeah, they can just can yeah. they email you directly. Sure. Absolutely. It's Kevin J. Gephardt, K E V I N the letter J Gephardt, G E P H A R T at gmail.com. And we'll, we'll link to, to your email as well below in the show notes. So you have access to Kevin's website where you could just email him directly for the 47 categories that thrive in recession and the four different types of shoppers or consumers that right. we need to consider. Uh, and, and, and I think it's a great times. door. Yeah, it's a great door opener. If you're trying to prospect, you can call a potential advertiser and say, you know what? I'm not sure if you know these categories or know how to speak to them, but we do. And I'd like to come out and have a, a discussion and see if we're a fit for you. It becomes a great door opener. And then once you land the business, of course, it's incumbent on you to be sure that you're adhering to those guidelines so that you speak to the right category in the way that they want to be spoken to. Kevin, I'm going to ask maybe the sales question of all time, just because you made me think of it. And it's a little bit of a little bit of a, a parallel path to some of this conversation, but is there any in local sales, is there any replacement for just beating the pavement and pulling doors? Is there any better way that to, to get in front of decision makers and, create action. I know, I know we've, you know, people, people, you know, pitch the course of never prospect again. And, and, and these things, is there any replacement for that stuff? Here's what I will say. 
I, I think you just said programmatic without saying programmatic. Mm-hmm. Sales reps, I know when I worked in bigger companies, sales reps were running in fear of programmatic. Our company is going to do programmatic. It's going to run us out of business. Yeah. Well, internet sales or programmatic sales did not put the travel agent out of business. People used to buy all their trips online. Travel agents are still thriving because they, they provide value added in the transaction. Mm-hmm. Financial advisors. I, I can go to my phone right now and I can buy any stock in the world. Mm-hmm. I don't need a financial advisor. But when you provide, when you position yourself as a resource, there's always going to be a need to have somebody help you through the process and somebody that's educated and that is a sustaining resource for you and your business. So um, there's no substitute. And because I've been in the business a while, um, I tend to know a lot of what I would call old school uh, ideas. And sometimes the younger reps go, oh, yeah, okay, well, that's 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 really quaint, baby boomer. But, you know. Give us an example. Things, what, 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 example, what an example. A perfect example. Powerful example. A handwritten thank you note <laughs> that it's nail mailed with a stamp. Say no on. more. People laugh. They go, Kevin, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you do that? When's the last time you got a handwritten note with a stamp on it? When When the whole world is zigging and you zag. You're going to get noticed. That's a big one. The other one, Tim, is canvassing. You literally take a. You know, I just had a, a, a call this morning with a, with a gentleman that I consult, and he's frustrated because he has a particular board in this town. It's the, it's a primo location. It's the best location uh, in town, and he can't sell it. And I said, get a, a great sales flyer put together. De jargon it. Please do not put jargon in there. Save the lats and longs and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. For Go out and canvas the area of that board. You you canvas with only one year contract options if they want something less. Obviously, you negotiate because now you're now you're all of a sudden you're having a dialogue with somebody you didn't even know about. Sure. So canvassing is another one of those old school tactics that just pays big dividends. And, and, and what like what, what is what does that mean practically? So I create a wager for this thing. I'm going out, just pulling doors. Even flyers or going First to of my all, local you have chamber. To, what 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 would you? You recommend? have to start with a sales flyer that has a compelling benefit headline. David Ogilvy, who was one of the mm. fathers of modern advertising, wrote a book back in I think it was sixty three, nineteen sixty three. It was called Ogilvy and Advertising, and he admonished. Oh, you got it under you got it under your desk. Hang on, hang on. I've got the uh, I've got the original. Ogilvy and Advertising, oh my and God. in the digital age, love oh my Ogilvy, God. Tim. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. If you open one of the first pages, he's going to talk about the fact that every ad must have a benefit headline. What is the yes. benefit headline? Yes. How much advertising do we see that has no benefit headline? So start right. with the benefit. Huh? All these great, all these great classic ads. And what do they all have? They all have really compelling headlines that that hook you. It's the same thing we're going to you know advise the the brand that ultimately buys the billboard to do. It's the same thing we're going to advise them to do with the billboard. You're saying do it on that one pager that you're going to create to market the billboard. When companies create one pagers to to do canvassing, they'll have maybe a thing that says available. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I, the case could be made, I suppose that available is a benefit headline, but that's not a compelling benefit headline. So you put a compelling benefit headline on the top of a flyer. You do a description of the, trade area that that board serves so you so that whoever sees this can get an understanding of the the qualitative and quantitative of that audience and then you take them through the fact that your company is turnkey so you're going to provide the creative you're going to provide the production you're going to provide the follow through the installation the follow through everything and you put all that that's your flyer mm. then somewhere in there you can get into all the jargon okay these are the lats and longs Here's the impression level, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing is you want to calculate reach and frequency based on a one-year contract. And everybody always wants to put reach as a percent. Okay, technically, legally, it is a percent. And maybe some ad agencies really fully understand the percent reach, although I would challenge that a lot of them don't. But you take that reach percentage and you divide it out across the population that you're measuring. So you get a number. 
32,500 prospects a week. Mm. That resonates with local advertising. If you say it's 12% of the market, what is that? Is that DMA? Is that CBSA? Uh, 12% it's, of what? Yeah, it's just jargon until you put it in the... And smaller market billboard sales reps go, well, I, I ran the reach on this, Kevin, and it's only 5,200 people a week. Great. If you're in a small market, it's a quantifiable number. It's an identifiable number. Right. The number is what the number is. Give them the number. Then they can decide, okay, that's worth it to me to have a message in front of 5,200 people a week. But those are the kinds of things you have to have in the flyer. And then, of course, for sure, have your contact information, right? Because oftentimes you're going to have to leave the flyer with a, uh, a gatekeeper at the front of the building, whatever. And then as you're, as you're, the other thing is, is as you're canvassing, don't stop at businesses that clearly are not going to be able to afford your board. You know, be a little more selective than that. Although you have to be careful not to prejudge. But I've I've done this. I did this early on in my because when I started with Clear Channel Outdoor, if you do the math back, I started in two thousand eight. Isn't that a great time to start a media sales job? 2008? Sure is. Hey, Kevin, <laughs> what's going to happen in the next 12 months is the economy is going to grind to a screeching halt and uh, mortgage default is going to raise to record high and no one's going to be able to afford anything. Right. But, but you're I, here. I, but I did the canvassing because I had, because I couldn't get, I couldn't get my family to call me back. Right. No one. Would call me. <laughs> sure. So I went out and canvassed and I got, I'll say a handful of annual contracts on various boards doing that. I would have never gotten that. It also allowed me because I was, I come from radio, extensive radio and, and some TV background. It allowed me to establish my out of home chops one-on-one -on -one with people so that I wasn't embarrassed. If I talked to, uh, if I talked to a big ad agency, I, I kind of knew what I was talking about. It's a powerful way to sell. It's a direct street level way to sell and it, it gets business. I, I love it. I love the, you know, anything that involves pulling up your bootstraps and going out there and pounding pavement and getting after it. I, I love, and I think that's, those are really, those are really tactical points to make something as simple as the layout of what that one pager is. It right? It's a compelling value driven hook, right? Hey, what's what, why should I care? to read next on this flyer. Okay. This has some very relevant information to me. How many prospective customers does it reach? I love just that, just that thing versus impressions, right? Impressions. What does that mean? You know, is this an estimate? Is this guaranteed? Right. Impressions just open up so many questions. Right. Um, you you want to have impressions on there. You can figure out some, some basic right. math. And, and, and you want to have impressions on there, especially cost per thousand, because then that's the common denominator that can right. compare with the other media. Early on in my billboard sales, one of the managers said, there is a client for every board. Because week after week, we're sitting in sales meetings, staring at these same set of boards that go unsold. And we had a discussion one time, and somebody brought up the fact that in one of the older parts of St. Paul, we had a billboard that never got sold. And somebody said, well, who'd want that? Because that's that's a bunch of old people that live around there. And I'm like, okay, if you're Coca-Cola, you don't want that board. If you're Subway, you don't want that board. But if you're Thrivent Financial, if you're RBC Wealth Management, if you're uh, a travel agent, you do want that board. Mm -hmm. It goes back to the yin and yang. For every billboard, there is a strength, but it's also weakness and vice versa. So there is a client for every board and you have to figure out who that client is and who would make use of that audience. There it is. The hot take. It's not a bad board. You're just selling it to the wrong person. Right. I love that. I think that that's a really powerful concept. Uh, and it, it, what it does is it creates possibility versus a very linear focus of, I have this, and it's this many dollars. There are only sales. these people thinking about it through the lens of this is, really what it is, it's, it's a real estate asset. And there is somebody who would like to live here. It's there's someone who's, whose brand would like to live on this for, for one reason or another. Um, Kevin, how do you stay up to date on what's going on uh, from a sales standpoint, from a media standpoint, where do you go for, uh, for your own education, inspiration, motivation, are you a reader, are you a podcast listener? What, 
What's all in your of that? And, and, I, and I'm not being paid to say this, but one screen is an enormous resource. And Tim Do wrote good stuff. Enormous resource. Oh, thank you. And so, yeah, I, I walk every day, three, three, four miles, or three, three and a half miles. And so I'm always trying to listen to something interesting. Sometimes I switch over to jazz. It just depends. But um, so I do a lot of podcasts. I do a lot of reading. There are a lot of publications I track. Um, uh, Billboard Insight, of course, being one because I have a, I'm an ongoing sales column contributor. But there are others. And uh, I, the OAAA is a phenomenal resource. And they put out a lot of information in the trade publications that you would otherwise have to have a membership to get, but they put it out there mm. for free. Right. So like a lot of these, pod, a lot of these email newsletters, like, like Billboard Insider publishes OAAA. In fact, they just had a piece on, on the recession itself and the threat of recession. And that's free to you where if you email the OAAA and said, Hey, can I get this? You know, that's reserved for membership. But, the and I'm not, I, I'm a huge advocate of the OAAA. I'm not saying don't become a member. I'm just saying that if you're an individual rep, um, the cost of becoming an individual member might be cost prohibitive. The other thing I, I wanted to mention is that one of the things I learned is that when you're in high commission or straight commission sales, you are an intrapreneur. Hmm. You are operating your mean? own. Yeah. You are operating your own business in the context of a larger business. So your office people are not entrepreneurs. They're hourly employees. You're, um, Ops people, the installers are not, they're eight to five people. And and even your manager and general manager are not entrepreneurs. They're typically more, more focused on salary. There's probably some bonus built in. But you as a straight commissioner, high commission salesperson is an entrepreneur. You're operating your own business. And I have a lot more to say about entrepreneurship. And there again, if somebody wants to email me and ask for the information on entrepreneurship, I'd love to share it. But the point I wanted to make is that just like advertisers, we encourage advertisers to spend three to 5% of their gross sales on advertising. We as entrepreneurs need to spend three to 5% of our gross income on building our business. And it's a long way to get back to your original question. How do you stay up on what's new? Plan to spend three to 5% of your gross income on growing your business. And then you'll be buying books You'll be buying access to uh, various internet tools. You'll be upgrading your technology so that it's state of the art. You'll be buying the book, the out of the ultimate out of home <laughs> sales Which, guide. Where, where can they get? Is it everywhere? Fine books are sold. Is it just no? On the it's, website? it's, it's where available exclusively book? through Billboard Insider, and um, you can a couple of ways. I, I'll I'll give you a link. You okay, just go great. to billboardinsider.com. And then you click on public. There's a little black banner about a third of the way down. You click on publications and then you click on there. And the top thing is going to be the sales guide. Click on that and just enter your information. And they'll ship you one up. We have a, a group uh, based out of Seattle that does very quick ship. So awesome. it usually goes out the day you order it sometimes at two days, but not very often. And, um, but purchasing that book, doing the other things that require an investment, buying access to databases like Hoover's or exact data can pay mm. big dividends because now you can get access to anybody you want. And the thing you can do too, is you find a, a, a couple of other sales reps in your office that are similarly motivated and you share the cost of like Hoover's or exact mm -hmm. data or something, or a sales navigator from LinkedIn. Some of those things that cost money that may, and, and maybe LinkedIn probably someone be saying this, but you you can share those costs, but you need to be investing in the growth of your business. I couldn't think of a better way to 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 bring it back home to the station, Kevin. Do uh, would would you like to make a bold prediction? Any bold predictions for out of home over the next twelve to eighteen months? Uh, anything you want to be on the record as having said here first? Well, let me put my answer into context. The digital roadside billboard is as old now as commercial television was in 1972. Wow. Okay. So television evolved a little bit since 1972. Sure, sure has. I'm telling you, we are on the cusp of explosive growth when it comes to digital audio. And I talk some in, in, in the book and then more on my website about what 
is lying ahead. What's lying ahead is digital billboards are high reach, a lot of high reach mediums, television, et cetera, but it's also real time. Now there are a lot of real time mediums, there's social media and, and various others, but we may be the only high reach real time medium available at scale in the entire country. Mm. And it's going to explode. We're never, I, I hope, Tim, this is a hope, not a prediction, that we quit putting static images on digital and that we speak to the audience that's standing there at the moment they are standing there. Sure. If we have a, a Monday message, a Tuesday message, uh, a Monday early morning message, a Tuesday late afternoon message, people's minds are in different places throughout the day and throughout the week. And we need, as advertisers, we need to capture the moment and market real time. I think that's the explosive growth. I think companies are starting to get it. And companies, advertisers I've talked to, they said, Kevin, I don't want to have to create all those different ads and and traffic all that. It's 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 a pain. And I would say, yes, succeeding is a pain. And you're going to go to all the investment of buying digital billboards, spend another 10% and have the messaging relevant and timely. And I, I hope that that's where the business is going. I think it is. And a few years from now, it's going to, when you see a static image saying sales starts on August 31st, instead of sales starts in two days, um, hopefully the, the dated ads will be gone. The real-time ads will prevail. And then we'll really unlock the, the power of digital, I think. Long live real-time. Kevin, this has been a lot of fun. We're going to have to do it again sometime soon. We'll link to everything that was mentioned here in the show notes. So if you're listening, wherever you're listening, you can come back, grab all the great resources, make sure to reach out to Kevin for the 47 recession proof categories, the four different types of recession buyers, make sure to check out billboard insider, get your hands on the uh, out of home ultimate sales guide. There's a lot of stuff. We've covered a lot of stuff. I pitched uh, a lot of stuff here, haven't I? Wow. I mean, packed with it's like, value. It's like packed a Ron Peel infomercial here. But you wait, don't have to more. buy it. You don't have to buy anything. I think that uh, you could just replay this and and uh, and be applying a, a lot of what we talked about here today and creating impact for yourself immediately. So, Kevin, I couldn't thank you more for uh, for being part of the conversation. Tim, it's been a huge pleasure. A long awaited huge pleasure. And, and we will do it again soon. Uh, I know the audience is going to love this one. So wherever you're listening to this, please like, follow, share, subscribe, leave a review. That's what helps the show grow. Share this with somebody else who could benefit. And until next time, we'll see you. Quarter century, I finally came to my senses. I finally got my hand up on the tinted Benz, kid. I see the world clear through my tinted lenses. With the dream and the drive, the possibilities endless. Now print that, send this all the way to Tokyo. Take a trip down south, down to Mexico. Next stop, Shanghai, the world class trade show. First class all the way, cause that's how we roll. Yeah, call us the rock star businessman. Rocking shows, we handle business, man. We got our own future in the palm of our hands. Cause divine